Hey, welcome back to A Different Atheist Reads, A History of God by Karen Armstrong. Christy Winters here, and I've just finished up doing the summary of Karen's introduction to the book before she moves into actually dealing with the content. In this video, I just want to present my critique, again, to give an idea where uh, um, an atheist is coming from, at least this atheist, when reading a book. The first thing that I want to say is that in an earlier video, I mentioned that I had had a really positive experience of A History of God when I read it early on in my deconversion process. That was a long time ago, getting on 20 years. So when I came back to the book, I had a very different perspective, different amount of education, different knowledge. But I want to point out what was really valuable about the book to me before I start this critique, which is that when I grew up, God had been presented in Catholicism as this monolith and certain thing, and that you there was a fixed thing that was God. What Karen's book did that was so important for me was to show that God could be constructed, and that there have been a lot of different constructions of God. And that, to me at the time, was very, very liberating. And yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Now when I've come back to it, I've gone through a process of evaluating a lot of the evidence that she raises uh, in her book myself, and I have done a lot of my own amateur research watching videos on YouTube, reading books just off the top of my head. I've, I've read and so I've done a lot of independent research and study on not only say, the different approaches to God, but also the textual evidence, the archaeological evidence. And in that, I now come from a very different place than I did when I first approached the book. I'm also, importantly, now an academic and having gone through the PhD process and being a published author where I have gone through the very, very painful and humiliating peer review process, I also have a different set of norms and a different set of values that I'm going to bring to the book than I did the first time that I read it. Lack of clear language. Lack of clear language. This is something that Karen does that drives me crazy. And I'm going to point out what I mean by a lack of clear language by looking at the first lines of the book that she opens with. It says, As a child, I had a number of strong religious beliefs, but little faith in God. There is a distinction between belief in a set of propositions and a faith which enables us to put our trust in them. But, like, okay, but what are they? What are these um, distinctions? And there are really three words in, in those two sentences that beg for a clarification. Beliefs, faith, and trust. Now, you can make an argument definitionally that these are three connected words, uh, but the problem is people use them in a lot of different ways. And when Karen Armstrong says something such as there is a distinction between belief in a set of propositions and a faith which enables us to put our trust in them. Well, what is that distinction? Can you define it? Can you clarify? This is an assertion. It's not an explanation. And I personally, because I deal with political behavior, I'm a social scientist, and we have a lot of concepts that we have to deal with. Having precise definitions of concepts is really, really important. And for me, you could trade you could have a strong religious faith, but little belief in God, or a strong religious faith, but little trust in God. You know, this is, ah, just tell me what you mean. Don't say that there is a distinction, then don't explain what it is. I, did I mention I'm going to be ranting? I'm going to be ranting a little bit in the video, but I'm hoping that if I get the rants out now, then I don't have to keep ranting. First problem that I have with Karen Armstrong that is a lack of clear language. The next one, the next problem gets down to the way she does her introduction. I understand that it's good to set up a personal relationship with your audience in an introduction. You want to make a personal connection. But the introduction to a book should really introduce the book. And she basically goes on a four-page autobiography without really connecting it to a larger question. You have to read through, I think, four pages before you get to the point where she actually discusses something about the book. And yes, in my introduction that I did, the review, I brought that list of attributes where we are able to evaluate how Karen herself goes through this process of feeling God is distant and associating him more with the, the agonies of hell, which feel closer and more personal than the transcendent God and how she broke that down and found a personal expression that dealt with creativity. Frankly, I did more work 
to provide a framework for interpreting her first four pages of her introduction than she did. And for me, that's just as an academic, you have a duty to always be showing your audience where they're going or connecting it to what they've already seen. So I read through the introduction quite frustrated going, okay, but what's the book about? What's the book about? What's the book about? And even then when I, we get to what the book about is about, we don't really get to what the book is about. Rant three, rant three, rant three is this really terrible habit she has of claiming to say what people think or what people believed at a certain time. And the problem I'm going to have with that repeatedly has to do with a lack of evidence. And let me explain. When we look at ancient writings to try to understand how the authors understood the world, we can only really speak about the understanding of the people for whom we have writing. Right? And those are going to be educated, wealthy, elite men for much of human history, and especially in this time period. So when Karen Armstrong in her chapters talk about what people thought about a, a myth, that, they, that people took it literally or people didn't take it literally, or what people believed, I just gotta say, how could you possibly know what slaves believed? How do, how do you know what women were thinking, Jewish women were thinking during the Babylonian exile? How can you possibly know what a young child was thinking? If you want to talk about what people think and what people believe, please point me to some evidence. Because if you tell me that people believed X, frankly, my undergraduate students wouldn't get away with that in their essays. <laughs> because if they said, well, people believe that, my question to them is, give me some polling data, give me some evidence. And I understand that they didn't have polls back in ancient times, but that's all the more reason to be careful about what we say people think, and especially about what women were thinking. Because if we start conflating the experiences of women and men to be what people think, then we're really ignoring the patriarchy that exists within these texts, women in the text, the fact that they're property. So, ugh, don't ever say what people think if you don't have evidence, please. Please. You can speculate, it might have been the case that some people thought this, or it might have been the case that some people approached it in that way, but unless you have evidence, please don't tell me what people think, because I won't believe you. The other thing that I want to say a little bit about her first few chapters is that I've noticed, uh, she published the book in 1993, which meant she was maybe even writing it in, you know, 1992, 1991, fair enough. But when I went to the sources, in her bibliography, in her notes, in the first several chapters, a lot of her books are really out of date. Really, really out of date. Like from the 70s, 60s, and before. I saw very little evidence of any modern scholarship in the first few chapters in terms of what she was referencing. That to me is problematic because when I went through the entire book, she did have more recent publications, things from the late 80s and the early 90s, but only on Islam. And it just seemed from looking at it that her understanding of Christianity kind of stopped in the mid-70s, and that might not be the case, but in terms of what she's referencing, it stops in the 1970s or 80s. You guys can check the book to get the, you know, the latest dates for her sort of Jewish chapters and chapters on Christianity, but that was my impression. And eh, as we move forward, um, you know, when we see her talking about Abraham or, or Moses, she's going to talk about them as historical figures, when really in the 1980s people were, knew that they were myths, that there was no historical Moses, there was no historical Abraham, there's no archaeological evidence to support 40 years of wandering in the desert, there's no archaeological evidence to support a lot of the claims that are made in the earliest books of the Torah. So, eh! Again, problematic because she's presenting a story, not necessarily presenting the facts. And I think that's going to be, for me, a problem. Now, what I'm going to do in terms of the, the book is when I take it forward, I'm not really going to treat Armstrong as giving a super historical evidence-based account. Instead, I'm going to take the book almost as her attempt at mythology, her attempt to provide a history for the God that she understands rather than an academic approach to understanding the history of God as it evolved based on, you know, the evidence. All right, so I've got one more rant, but it's a two-parter. It has to do with an essentialist claim. I know I mentioned in an, an earlier video, didn't really follow up on, I'm sorry, but I'll do it here. And then also an approach to her, the way she views atheism. The essentialist claim is that we all are seeking God. And I think I mentioned that this is where she finds the grounds, I think, for the validity of all spiritual experiences. 
Yeah, not really. Not really. Not all of us are searching for God. And the idea that humanism is a religion is just wrong. It's just wrong if you look up what the definition of a religion is. And the idea that it does have a set of beliefs that involve some kind of supernatural force or a creator of the universe. That's a religion. Humanism, not a religion. Because there is, it doesn't have any of the qualities that a religion would have. And I'm, I'm actually going to go back to my favorite source, Wikipedia, which I all knew you all love as such a credible source. But it's actually pretty good for a general, you know, explanation. The first Humanist Manifesto was issued by a conference held at the University of Chicago in 1933. They identified humanism as an ideology, not a religion, ideology, that espouses reason, ethics, and social and economic justice, and they called for science to replace dogma and the supernatural as the basis of morality and decision making. I really can't see how you get any farther from a religion than that, because religions do have beliefs about the supernatural and about a creator God, um, and those are what define a religion. Just calling humanism a religion doesn't actually make it a religion, so I completely reject that idea. The other thing that I mentioned in her video was her approach to atheism. And the way that she sees atheism is a corrective mirror to theists. And we, uh, atheists, I guess, when people put up a conception of God, atheism is a way to reject that conception because it's completely in, in, incomplete. This is problematic for the reason I got back to in, in my video about not having common definitions or putting ideas in a conceptual box and then saying we can't say anything about it. Because what she's saying is that every particular conception of God that's been brought out, whether it's patriarchal or 18th century, whatever else, when atheists reject that, they're just rejecting that particular manifestation of God. But they're not really rejecting God, God, because God, God is the reality that we can't describe. So they can never really touch that God. They can never get at him. They can never really engage with him. They can never take him up and his existence up because they're only ever dealing with a, a mirage, an epiphenomenal experience or a portrayal of God that has no substance that is actually connected to the real God. Yeah, that's just not particularly helpful, right? What you're saying is that God exists, but every time you try to describe God, if an atheist brings up an objection, you just go, well, you know, words can't really say what that is, so you're not really rejecting God because you can't, because I put God on a special box on a special shelf, and you can't do anything to him. That's just bullshit. I'm sorry. And as an atheist, it's really insulting to hear that I am nothing more than a mirror to the beliefs of theists. Not true. It's not true that atheists only reject a particular idea of God um, in a particular time period. I think ontologically, epistemologically, morally, historically, scientifically, we have a lot of objections to what people claim about God. And basically what she's saying here is that her history is a history of what people create expressively from uh, themselves about God. Not that God is an external coming in that people are relating it, but rather they're inventing their own ideas of God. And if you're saying that, that everyone is inventing their own idea of God, well then you can't really blame atheists for coming along and saying that just doesn't make any sense to me. That is just made up. And our purpose as atheists is not to merely exist to help theists refine their idea of God. It's really, to me, like I said, really egocentric and self, selfish and arrogant to really be that, that dismissive of really thoughtful people. People who have taken the time to investigate these questions and who have scientific answers to questions and who have ontological objections to assertions about the nature of God and who have epistemological concerns about claims about reality based on ineffable personal experience, to be told that we're just really there to uh, help theists along the way. I, I don't really think that it's helpful. So um, let me just check. Um, yeah, I think that's it. 
I think that's pretty much all of my ranting. What I'm going to do in future videos is I'm not going to point out every single time Karen Armstrong does something that drives me crazy because I don't want that to be the focus of the book series. I really do want to get through the book and I really do want to deal with the content. But I also felt like I really needed to push back on a lot of the assumptions and the essentialism in terms of what it means to be human and what we all do. And also to push back on claims of what, what people think uh, without evidence forcefully because it's important, but I don't want to have to do it every single time. So what I'm going to do, I think, is when I get to the end of a chapter, uh, I might have a summary, like how many times did Karen do things that drove me crazy, and I'll write them out, and, and I'll just put that up in my own video critique, because I don't want it to influence her, my presentation of her work. Right, got that off my chest. I feel so much better now. <sighs> All right, and hopefully now that it's off my chest, we won't have to do this again. I've been Christy Winters. This has been a uh, different atheist reads, History of God. You've been awesome, and I will see you in the next video. Bye.